All right, I think we can, uh, we can get started um, since the room is full already. <laughs> um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, the, uh, the size of the class is, is, uh, is unusually big this year. And so we're not exactly sure how we're going to accommodate it. I'm kind of waiting to see what happens this week in terms of, uh, you know, because it's still ad drop week, so I know you guys are still deciding which classes you're going to stick with. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to, uh, to sort of take any uh, dramatic actions until, we're, uh, until we're, we're clear what the actual size of the class is going to be. Um, so I'm sorry. I, I, this is, you know, it's a very, it's a very big problem uh, all over. The, the pressure on classrooms and the size of classes. So it's not like there are some, there's some larger classroom that we can just uh, walk into. But um, let's, ju let's see how it goes for the, for the time being. And then hopefully things will stabilize. Although, you know, like I say, I'm not sure quite what we would do if we had too many people for this class um, going forward. Too, too many people in this room. A um, couple of things that have come up. So I've had a couple of questions about the homework. The homework, which was uh, posted last week, is due on Wednesday. And the, um, the idea is that you work out the questions on paper, and you hand in a little packet of you know, your homework packet uh, on, in class on Wednesday. So at the end, of, they'll sort of, we'll pile them up somewhere, I don't know, maybe on the floor here. And then at the end of the class, we'll take them away for grading. So that's, that's kind of the deadline for handing them in, is, uh, is by the end of class on, on Wednesdays, normally. Um, questions about how to actually submit the uh, MATLAB portion. Uh, normally, we would want to see a printout, either of the, the output or the, the commands or the script, or whatever makes sense. In order, that's, that's the uh, mechanism for, for communicating what you've done in MATLAB. Just to make, makes the mechanics of grading and t handing them back much much easier to have everything on paper. Um, I've had a couple of questions about the textbook. Uh, as I mentioned, the um, the the textbook which I'm hoping to use is the one from the the third edition. Um, this one, right, which is actually now from 2005. And there's, there's a fourth edition, which I think is from 2011. Um, but I, I'd rather work with a third edition just because that's the, everything is key to that at the moment. But some people have said, oh, I, I ordered this book and I got the fourth edition. Um, so if, if, if you're having trouble getting third edition, let me know. We're probably going to stick with it. Most of the material is, most of the you know, description is essentially the same in the fourth edition. So as a reference, it's fine. The only difference is that the section numbers are different, and the question numbers at the end of chapter sec question sets are different. We're assigning the homeworks from the end of number sections. So it's, you know, uh, and the questions aren't quite the same. So it's not just a question of going through and changing. So rather, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a solution. If, if you don't have access to a third edition, we'll figure out some kind of solution. But if you have a choice, then this is the one to go for. And let me know. I'm interested in knowing if, it, if it's become, because last year it was not a problem for people to get hold of this one. But it may be that eventually it's sort of the pipeline is running dry. So let me know if, there's a, if it's difficult to get hold of so I can adjust going forward. Um, let's see, any other questions? Logistics? Yeah. I am wearing a mic. Yes. So the, uh, I, I, in my history of teaching, uh, one of the recurrent criticisms I've had is that um, my voice tends to trail off. And particularly at the back of a, a room like this, it can get difficult. Now, sometimes I'm teaching in rooms which have actual speakers, but this one does not appear to. So I brought my own speakers in. So I'm actually trying to reinforce my voice through these speakers, which I will now turn up. OK. So. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. It sounds a little. It sounds a little weird up here, but uh, hopefully that will help. I, I, got, I got this mic a couple of years back, and it seemed it seemed to help. But um, it's sort of it's different every time. Okay. So 
let's get on with this material. So we have um, this original first slide pack. Whoa. Um, hang on. Okay. Um, of basically fairly basic definitions and just trying to get us all on the same page. It's very nothing, uh, nothing too conceptually deep, but just you know to get us warmed up, to get us make sure we're all using the same terminology. But I, at the end, at the sort of the material we gotten into last week was just talking about the contrast between analog signal processing, the original just plain signal processing, and digital signal processing, signal processing done with computers, with digital systems. And I was talking about the differences, the strengths and weaknesses of digital signal processing. And one of the interesting, one of the strengths is that there are various things you can do with DSP that would, would be very difficult or impossible to do in the analog domain. And a, a nice example of this is this idea of timescale modification, which is the idea of taking a piece of sound, say speech, and changing the duration of the speech without changing its other properties. So let me just quickly run through this MATLAB example, which is what I wanted to show you at the end of last lecture, but we ran out of time. And this is on the, uh, again, it's all on the website, but here is the, uh, the script that includes these examples. So um, we can load a, we can load a sound file into MATLAB like this, we have read, and we can listen to this. This might be loud. A football team coach has a watch, then a Zodan. Okay, so it's just a piece of speech that's been recorded and sampled, and D is a, uh, a vector here in MATLAB, so it's uh, 49,000 samples long by one channel. And SR, in this case, is the sampling rate, so it's sampled at 16,000 samples per second. So 49,000 samples is about three seconds, a little more than three seconds of speech, which is what we heard. And, you know, we can, um, we can plot D in MATLAB, which will give us this nice plot of these other 49,000 values plotted against, you know, from 1 to 49,000 with the actual value here between minus 0.2 and 0.2 shown. And if we zoom in on this, um, we can see what looks more like a conventional spectrogram type display, right? So here's the actual, uh, the waveform of the, of the speech, which is some, like the thing we saw last week with the live pseudo spectrogram display. This is the actual variation in time, but now these are individual samples. So this is, you know, this is like 500 samples, uh, 16,000 samples a second is, you know, a few tens of milliseconds. Okay, now, we heard that speech, and if we wanted to slow it down, one thing we could do is simply um, reduce the sampling rate. That is, rather than sending 16,000 samples out to the D to A converter every second, we could send, say, 12,000 out. And that means that the entire, you know, it would take us four seconds to play the entire 48,000 group of samples. And so the sound uh, would take longer, which is what we're trying to achieve. So if we do that, we can actually just. Um, so this is the original sound with a sampling rate of 16,000. A football team coach has a watch, then a Zodan. And I think MATLAB will let me specify any sampling rate here, so. A football team coach has a watch, then a Zodan. So that was like the four second version of the speech and it took longer. But it also sounded weird, right? Because what happened was we slowed down the speech the thing that sounds weird is, well, there are a bunch of things that sound weird about it, but one of the things you notice is that the, the pitch drops. And now what happened was, you know, if this was, the pitch is, this periodic repetition we see here leads to the pitch. That's just perceptually how it works, that you voice, you know, you have the vocal folds and they're flapping periodically, and that periodic repetition or near repetition is perceived as the pitch of speech. When we slow this down, so it takes four thirds as long, the spacing between these pitches, these pulses gets longer, and so the pitch goes down. Yeah? Would, um, like if I try to think about it, I, I would think about it backwards. <coughs> Having more samples make it longer and less samples make it shorter? Yeah, more, yeah, exactly. But it, it, it's, um, it, it does make sense. Whichever way you want to explain it makes sense. But here's the thing, right? So. Um, if we sampled at a higher sampling rate, then we would get more samples. So if we sampled at 20,000 samples a second, then for one second of speech, we get 20,000 samples. If we play them back out at 20,000 samples a second, we get the same speech. If we play them back out at 10,000 samples a second, 
then we're sending, we've got the same number, same amount of data, but we're sending it out slower, so it takes longer to get it all out. So that's why when we lower the sampling rate, the pitch goes down. It's, it's on playback. You know, if we'd done the other way around, if we'd had a lower sampling rate when we recorded and then played back at a higher sampling rate, then the pitch would have gone up because we would have had less data and it would have got, gone out more quickly. Yeah? Uh, you know, so is the playback rate the same? It depends what you, how you define playback rate, right? I mean, so the sampling rate, the number of samples per second is I, I'm effectively, I don't know, obviously in, in terms of hardware, something's happening, some, something's being interpolated somewhere. But here I'm saying, no, I'm, I'm running my D2A at a lower rate on playback. So I sampled in at 16,000, and I'm, then I'm feeding them out at 12,000, and so they take longer to, to get them all out. And that's why it sounds lower. This, is, this, this approach to changing the, changing the sampling rate is a slightly you know, confusing way of thinking about it. It has a very clear analog uh, precedent in the, in the analog domain, which is if you're playing a tape, you know, the tape records the actual pressure as a variation in the magnetic field on the tape. And so you, you, know, you have a little head, it reads the tape, and whatever the magnetic field is, that's the voltage that gets sent to the speaker. If, you, if you've got this reel-to-reel -reel tape, say, and you just sort of slow down the, the, the reels by, you know, touching them or something, then the tape runs slower and the pitch drops. And so it's exactly that. Or if you're playing, a, if, you're, if you've ever seen an actual LP, an actual vinyl record, you know, spinning around at 33 and a third revolutions per, per minute, you slow it down, then the pitch or everything drops, the, the music plays back slower. So that's, it's, we're doing the same thing, just we're doing it by manipulating Z2A. Yeah. So, uh, what's the uh, uh, sampling rate at which the sound actually is being recorded? Yeah, the sampling rate, that's, that's what's stored in the file. So it's this number I got back from when I read, read the file, which is 16,000. Okay. So basically, when you're playing back at 12,000 yeah. samples per second, so basically, say, the, discarding certain samples out of those 16K and then... Yeah, no, we're not, discard, we're not discarding any samples. That would be fine. That would be the way to do it, to make it sound the same duration, right? We could discard um, one of every four samples, and then we'd, have, we'd now have 12,000 samples per second. And that would sort of sound a little bit dirty, but it would sound okay. God, I can oh, even do that. So say out of every sixteen thousand slots, there are only twelve thousand audio slots available and then the rest are like No. Are what am I I'm just I'm just they're just you know, I've got it's like this this buffer, right? I've got this the D two A, which is taking one sample every 12,000th of a second and sending it to a voltage. And I'm saying, I'm stacking it up with like, well, here are 48,000 samples. And 48,000 samples were supposed to last three seconds. But now, because I'm only using them one every 12,000 a second, it lasts four seconds. And so the speech, speech lasts longer and the pitch is lower. Okay, but this is not what, <laughs> this is not the point of this example. That's meant to be like, okay, um, if we played it slower, <laughs> It'll last longer, but it sounds wrong. You could, and, and I've said, you can do that with analog, fine. You can do it, it's sort of, in a sense, it's more natural in analog, because we're not worried about you know, the definitions of like, well, what exactly does this sample mean? It's just, it, we're just taking away form, where we're literally pulling on it like it was on an elastic sheet, and so it gets longer, and the spaces between everything get stretched out a little bit, and the, the perceptual effect of that is the, the pitch dropping. If we wanted to do this, to change the effective duration of the speech without changing the other characteristics, in particular, without changing the spacing between these things on the same, on the same time base, then it's like, okay, well, that's kind of hard to do, because now we're going to say, let's say we want to make this last longer. If we have um, a little burst of speech like this, right? It's got these pulses we can see. We want to keep the pulses the same duration. We want to make the whole thing last twice as long. We're going, to have to, we're going to have to somehow insert more pulses, which is like, well, you know, there aren't, those are the pulses we've got. They're not identical. They're nearly, they're sort of somewhat repetitious, but each one is unique. So to make it twice as long, we're going to have to make stuff come from somewhere. And that's something that's very hard to think about in the analog domain, but it's not that hard to do in, in the digital domain. And um, I'll just play you the result. So um, I have this, I implemented this routine by it was invented by Don Hejner, or it was actually a bunch of people who invented it. There was a guy, Selim Rukas, who invented it in the mid-80s, and then Don Hejner improved it in 1990, called SOLAFS. And so, let's see, what is the routine? Here we go. So now I'm going to slow it down by the same amount, or more or less the same amount, which is like 
So now I get a new waveform out. So the length of D, remember, was about uh, 40, 49,000 samples or 16 kilohertz. Now DD is my delay, my stretch D, and it's longer. It's 70,000 samples. So if we listen to this at the original 16 kilohertz, right? So we're not messing with sampling anymore. Forget about that. So now we're just going to play this modified version by the Solaps algorithm. Football team coach has a watch, then has a dime. So it still sounds a little bit strange because the speech has been slowed down. So it sounds like he's speaking unnaturally slowly. But the pitch is not modified. The formants, which are the resonances that define the different speech sounds, which also made the, the earlier one sound weird, they, they've not been modified. And so we've achieved what we want to achieve. And if we actually look at the um, waveform here, let's see if I can do this. So we can see them side by side. Um, OK, so here are the two waveforms. Now, they look kind of the same, but they're different durations. This one's 50,000 samples, and this one's 70,000 samples. So that if we uh, put them on the same time base, they would we'd be able to see a difference. So actually, now, if we zoom in on this little chunk here, and zoom in on the corresponding chunk here, then we see what I was describing, that the spacing between the pulses, assuming the time bases are the same, which they look about the same, the spacing between the pulses is approximately preserved, but there's just more pulses here, which is what, you know, what we wanted to do. We wanted to make this whole burst last a little longer without changing the spacing of the pulses. We need to insert, insert more pulses. What SOLAPS does, just very uh, briefly, is it looks for the actual pulses, and then it says, well, I want to make this a little bit longer. Um, I've actually got room now to insert a whole extra pulse, so it just duplicates some of these, or it crossfades. It sort of aligns, lines them up and then figures they line up very well here and crossfades them, so you end up with some sort of interpolated extra pulses. And it's, you know, it's somewhat tricky, but it's something you can do on a computer. It's just a piece of code, and you get this result. And so you can slow down speech, or at the same time, you know, slowing down speech is useful for, you know, if you're trying to, phon phoneticians like it to listen to exactly how someone's saying something, or second language learners can find it useful. And you might want to um, also speed up speech, so you can listen to it more, care more, more quickly. So here's an example of that. So this factor here in the, in the cell ass routine is just the, the speed factor. So if you listen to this. Football team coach has a watch, then it's a dime. So now it sounds like he's speaking very fast, like a, a news presenter or something. OK, so that's just, I mean, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, how cell ass does that when we get on to correlation. But the basic point here is, yeah, we can um, we can use digital discrete time processing to um, implement things which would be just you really wouldn't want to have to worry about how to do this in analog. In fact, people were trying to do this in analog. Is that not in analog? No, they would. They try to. They would. The, the early systems try and do this, like they're a, a harmonizer. A harmonizer is something you have in a in a music studio that. Um, takes a pitch, takes someone singing, and then produces someone singing in harmony at the same time, or in close to real time. And it's basically the same problem. You have to now keep the timing the same, but insert extra pitch pulses because you're trying to make the pitch higher. And the, the first real-time harmonizers came out in the 70s, and they were implemented in you know, discrete operations, which is, they didn't, it wasn't someone writing a piece of code. It was a set of you know, gates and multipliers. But I think it was still, I think they were all in, in, in digital processing. OK. All right, so now um, let's get through this set of definitions and basic um, operations that we have to work on. So we're dealing with discrete time signals, which is basically means we're forgetting for the moment the quantization in amplitude. It's the, the sampling in time that's the thing that really makes a big difference. And so what we have is basically a sequence of values, like the 49,000 values that we had for that piece of speech. By the time they get to our processing, it's just a series of numbers. They could have come from anywhere. But very often, they have actually either come, and in the case of speech, they were obtained by taking a continuous voltage, continu a voltage that was continuously varying in time, and then sampling it every 16,000th of, of a second. And so that we can think about this underlying smooth analog waveform and the discrete the discrete sequence as the samples of that waveform at particular points in time. You can get other signals which are intrinsically discrete, 
you know, like, um, maybe, well, something like, something that only gets, you know, doesn't really exist until you measure it, like the unemployment rate or something. It's not like you can't talk about the unemployment rate on a fractional basis, but, so we have it, you know, have it every, whatever it is, week, but whatever it is, we've got the general idea of, for me, certainly, when I'm thinking about a discrete time signal, I'm almost always thinking about it as a sample version of a continuous time signal. And so in this case, we have our x of n. We use square brackets to de denote the um, discrete sample index here, and that, that that's going to be, in this case, going to be x of a, an analog signal with round parens indicating continuous time um, argument of n times t. So this is the continuous time argument, but it's just n, the integer index, times the sampling interval big T. That's, that's what the sampling is saying here. It's saying, well, x of a takes on values at every possible time, but we're only looking at it at these few discrete intervals, and then we're storing those values as our sequence. And so in this case, we'd call t the sampling period, and so 1 over t would be the sampling frequency, and so for the speech example, 1 over t was 16,000 samples per second. Um, we just, in terms of notation, we write a sequence as a set of, we can write a sequence as a set of values separated by commas, surrounded by braces, um, and then because the sequence has, you know, it's x of n and n has a particular value, we sometimes need to indicate where the origin is. n can be both positive and negative, and so in, in Mitra they use this convention of putting an arrow underneath the zero value. So this is x of zero, x of one is 1.1, .1, x of two is 0 0.2, etc. You, this just totally means nothing other than just it's the convention, so we can notate these things. Okay, so here's some definitions. Left and right side of sequences. Um, X of n can maybe define for all n, or it may only be defined for certain values of n. And so if, uh, if X of n is only defined for some finite set of values of n, say between n1 and n2, where they could be anything, then um, we call it finite length. If it's defined from value n1 to value n2, how long is the sequence? Plus one, thank you. So yeah, clearly it's from n, n2 minus n1, but it's got both of the end points, so it's n2 minus n1 plus one. Um, you know, maybe if we were, you know, if we work, if we're, if we're trying to define this in a more natural way, we might make this a strictly less than, and then the length would be n2 minus n1. If n is, if x of n is defined for all values of n which are larger than n1, right? So it's n1 is the lower, the lo the lower edge, and then n is, can be anything greater than that. Then we call it a right-sided sequence, because if we plotted it like this, we'd have n1, and then we'd have, we'd have nothing prior to n1. Here it's sort of, I've actually plotted these values as zero, but we're not saying they're zero, we're just saying they don't exist at all. We're saying that x of n exists for everything after n1 and beyond. And so that's to the right-hand side, we call it right-sided. We also call this a causal sequence, uh, well, particularly if m1 is greater than zero, um, because this is the kind of thing where the, um, if this was the out, why do we call it a causal sequence? We'll see why I call it a causal sequence, but it's because if we think of this as what happens to a system after we put an impulse in, after we kick it, if everything that happens after we put an impulse in is forward in time, that it's it's happened, it doesn't have to know about the future to decide what the output is. Whereas if, if it had to know what was going to come at time zero to generate what was going to happen at time minus 10, then it would require knowledge about the future, which is not causal. Uh, the converse of a right-sided sequence is a left-sided sequence where n can be any value as long as it's not larger than n2. This is a, a left-sided sequence. We have lots of values up here, but then we have nothing defined. You know, we do, it's, you ask me for what x of n2 plus 1 is, and it's like, well, I don't know, we haven't, we haven't defined it, it's not specified. And so that's sometimes called, called an anti-causal sequence, is the, is the converse, the complement of a causal sequence. If we have a sequence where we've got values that are undefined, of course, we can always turn it into an infinite extent sequence just by saying, oh, it's zero for all those values I didn't define otherwise. 
that there is a difference between an infinite length sequence where we know that it's zero for every value before n equals zero, say, and a finite length sequence which is saying, well, I'm really only defining this sequence for n greater than or equal to zero. Um, okay, so what can we do with sequences and how are we going to describe this? We don't, we don't do anything terribly complicated, um, but there are some things we do need to do. So we want to be able to add sequences. Um, so, which, you know, is this an operation we're familiar with. So this is saying that y of n, the sequence y of n, which takes on a lot of different values for different values of n, is produced by taking x of n and w of n and adding them. So we can write that down algebraically as y of n equals x of n plus w of n. But when we write this, you know, n is unspecified. This is a statement about uh, sequences, not about individual values. You know, we could say this is true for n equal 5 or something, but we're, we're not, we're not, we're, here we're saying it's equal for all n. So it's a, a description of the, the sequences. And here, the implication is it's, you know, it's, it's a something that is, doesn't change with time. And so we just run x and w through this and we get a y out. And that's kind of like a fixed relationship between them. And, you know, we think this is definitely thinking about hardware, right? It's, it's actually thinking, you know, rarely will these things actually be implemented by hardware anymore. But uh, they're, we're, they're based on the idea of actual box where you've got some wires that correspond to x and some wires that correspond to w and an adder that has an output. Um, another thing we want to do is scaling or multiplication by a constant. And so we denote this by this. So we've got this thing which reminds us of a, an op-amp in analog electronics. X of n, constant a, giving us y of n. So y of n is a times x of n, right? Simple, simple scaling. Um, of course, we might also want to multiply by uh, a sequence. So now y of n is point, the pointwise multiplication of x of n and some other sequence w of n. And here, we denote this as an, a circle with an operator in it, but now it's the multiplication operator instead of the plus operator. Um, to distinguish this from scaling, this is, we can call this modul a modulator. And of course, that name comes from the uh, principle in communications where you take a, uh, a carrier signal and uh, an envelope or something you're trying to modulate onto the carrier, you multiply them together, where the carrier is a you know, high frequency radio carrier or something like that. But, so this is, for that reason, this is called a modulator. Um, one of the other ways the way you end up multiplying two sequences together is in windowing, where uh, very often if we want to do some operation that is somehow local in time, like we want to calculate whether a signal is present at some point, we've got some very long signal, we've got some processing which will decide whether it's present. We want to know where it's present. And so we, we take a little subsequence of our infinite duration sequence or our uh, unlimited sequence, and we process that. And, so, and sometimes we often want to maybe even give it smooth edges, so we taper it out. And that would be this kind of operation. So where maybe W is this nice tapered window that is only non-zero over some finite range of points. And so we can notionally take our unlimited infinite duration X of n, multiply it by W of n, but we know that W of n is only non-zero over a certain range. So basically we're pulling out a range of points of X of n and then maybe shaping them a little bit to give us our Y of n that we can work with. Again, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the discrete uh, discrete Fourier transform. <coughs> Time shifting is another thing we can do with a sequence. Okay, so we've got these, we're, you know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, algebraic notation, talking about entire sequences at once. And so we can say, well, we've got two sequences, y of n and x of n, and the relationship is that if I have a particular point, y of n, it's equal to some point in x of n, but not at x of n. It's at x of n minus n. So that if we have y of 0, y of 0 is actually equal to x of 0 minus n, or x of minus n. And if we have y of big N, then y of big, of big N is equal to x of big N minus n, or x of 0. And so it's like what happens in y is what happened in x big N points earlier. if big N, earlier implying that big N is a, a positive number. 
And of course, n, because the argument inside these square brackets has to be an integer, we only define it for you know, a sequence where we can only talk about the value of a sequence for a natural number or an int integer anyway. Um, big N has to be an integer. OK, so for positive values of N, if we define it this way, it's like, this is slightly, you know, why, do we, why are we using minus rather than plus here? And the reason that we always use minus is because that means that um, if we have a positive N, then it's a delay, which is kind of the most natural thing. Because a delay is something you can actually do, right? I can take a sequence, I can delay it. Whereas the opposite, making y of n be equal to x of n from some point in the future, that's hard to do in real time. So um, we, d we define it this way so that n greater than 0 means a delay, which is something we can actually build. The notation for this is z to the minus 1. Um, it's putting it through a box with z to the minus 1. And that's because, as we'll see, the z transform of a unit delay is z to the minus 1. But here, it's, we can just view it as a convention. We could have used a, a big D for a single sample delay, but what we, what we use is z to the minus 1. So this y of n, x of n goes in, so z to the minus 1 gets y of n out, means that y of n is equal to x of n minus 1, which is the same as saying that y of n is x delayed by one sample. The value of y is, at every time, is the value that x had the previous time slot, so it's been delayed by one sample. And of course, you know, this, again, you can think of this as hardware, as this little register, this little, you know, single memory that, or a latch that stores the previous value and then outputs the next clock, clock cycle. Yeah? But it's because when we get onto the Z transform, this is going to be what the, what the actual Z transform of this thing is. Uh, and, you know, which makes a lot of sense because actually in, in Z transform, what you do is you multiply by this. And so, you know, this is, this is nice to read once you've got the Z transform ideas behind you. But right now, it's just like, okay, it's, it's the convention. It's just what we write in there. But it's not, it's not totally, you know, obtuse. So there is a, there's a good reason for it, which will hopefully make sense later on. For n less than zero, that would mean that actually y is looking at, you know, y is taking on what the values that x is going to take on later. So we're advancing the signal, which of course, you know, you can't do in real time, but you can do if you have the entirety of x already sampled into your uh, computer beforehand. And so actually in, um, in Z transform terms, that, that means the, we're reciprocating it. And so the advance operation would be Z to the plus one, or Z, um, which, which gives us this effect of y of n is x of n plus 1. y of 0 is x of 1. We're looking one step into the future. But in, and in terms of the, what it would look like on a, you know, a waveform display, um, for me, it would be moving it this way, which I guess for you is moving it that way. We're moving it back in time to advance the signal, to look at the signal later on in time. Um, this is kind of, you know, this is the, this is the, the, the magic, the essence, the thing that makes us do interesting things, that, that lets us have interesting systems with different frequency domain behavior. So we've got some basic operations here. We can put them together, and we can make these kind of signal flow diagrams, which is a graphical representation of a particular processing scheme. And so what we're seeing here is we have an input, a single input x of n, a single sequence of inputs. We have a scaling by alpha 1 here. We have a single step delay. You know, it's basically a one single latch. So we have x, I mean, if it was, if you're actually building it, right, an x of n was a discrete signal, which would be stored as a binary number. So it would be like, you know, 16-bit latch or whatever. So you'd store all 16 bits and then wait until the next click clock so you can read them out. But whatever, we're not worrying about the, the binary representation. We can view it as a single line here. So you have a delay. And so this thing here, after you put x of n through a delay, you get x of n minus 1, right? We can, at any point in time, we can say, well, actually, the value here is x of n minus 1 for some, for some value of n, if the value here is x of n. We can scale that by another constant here, alpha 2, and then we can do that another couple of times. So we, now we have four versions of n, basically x, x, so four versions of x, x of n, and then the three preceding values, x of n minus 1, x of n minus 2, x of n minus 3. 
then we've got these four scaling constants, alpha 1 through alpha 4. We multiply each of those values by those things, and then we sum them up in a summation node here. We've got four sequences coming in. We sum them to give us y of n. And so we can look at this, and we can write down this algebraic representation, which is essentially identical, saying the y of n is alpha 1 x of n plus alpha 2 x of n minus 1. So it's this, this chain plus alpha 3 x of n minus 2 plus alpha 4 x of n minus 4. Sorry, x of n minus 3. You see how we got um, x of n minus 3 by a set of successive delays. It was kind of, you know, it was this nice little efficient trick. We could have actually put, you know, three z to the minus 1s in sequence and fed it straight down here. But we would have ended up with, you know, more z to the minus 1 boxes on, on, the, on the diagram than we needed. But it would have been an equivalent implementation, if you like. And it would have given us the same expression down here, the same signal. So this, um, on the one hand, may look like kind of just an arbitrary way of sticking these things together just to give us an example. But it also turns out this is a, a general form of FIR filter, finite impulse response filter we'll find out, which is you know, a basic building block of signal processing. We can do a lot of useful things with this, with this filter. Of course, it's not one filter. It's got these parameters, alpha 1 through alpha 4. And by having different values of those different parameters, we can build filters that select different frequencies, basically. And the trick is knowing how to choose the values of alpha to do what you want. So while we're on this subject, uh, basically those, so those are the only, only operations that, that actually matter that we'll really use. But while we're defining operations, let's just um, define a couple of other ones. Up and down sampling, and this is going to pull us back to this kind of discussion about different sampling rates, which I kind of didn't want to get into because it's, it's, it's it can be confusing to think about. But, um, you know, if we have a sequence of 10 points, we can think about trying to use that to derive a sequence of five points or a sequence of 20 points by, you know, the, as best possible represent the same thing but in different numbers of samples. So we can talk about upsampling as making a sequence that has more samples in it but sort of covering the same chunk of real time if you're thinking about it in, 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 as, a, as a sampling or real sequence. And downsampling as the reverse of that, using fewer samples to cover the same amount of real time. Upsampling is called interpolation because you have to insert extra samples. Downsampling is called decimation because you're throwing away, you're discarding some of the samples you started with. So let's start with down, downsampling. We have a, a, a notation here for it. X of n downsampled by a factor m to give us some other sequence, xd of n. Now the, this suddenly um, becomes... These, these diagrams become harder to draw, right? Because um, when we had the flow diagrams before, you think of a value on every, on every arc and that the values change at the same rate. But here, you know, we have to put in m values here before we get a new value out here because we're throwing away m minus 1 of those values and just keeping the, 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 the zeroth one, as it were. Here's algebraically what we're saying. We're saying that the output of the downsampler for some, some sequence, you know, for some point in the sequence n is the value of the input sequence for n times n. So the zeroth value is the zeroth value. But n equal 1, the first value here, is actually x of m, the mth value of the input. xd of 2 is x of 2m, etc. And so that's, you know, in order to get l points, an l point sequence here, you have to have an l times m point sequence here. m has to be an integer. You know, m could be 2 to have a sequence that's uh, half as long, or it could be some higher number to get a sequence that's even smaller. Um, graphically, here is a, down, a downsampling by three operations. So here's a nice sampled sinusoid with, uh, I don't know, 20, 24 samples or something uh, per cycle. We downsample it by three, and this, this is still recognizably a sinusoid, but it's a sinusoid with many fewer samples per cycle. So when we draw out the first 50 points, and this is assumed to extend indefinitely, when we draw out however many points we need, then we get more cycles. But here's the thing, right? So the zeroth point here is the zeroth point here. Then we have two, we're down something by three, so we discard three minus one, we discard two samples. We get the third point here, which is now 
the second point out here, this card two samples, get a point here, which is this one, etc. So you can see the values here are every third value from this input sequence. That's what decimation means, that we throw, throw away uh, some, most or some of the input samples. Yeah? Um, because, that's a good question, um, and maybe I should have drawn this differently. But basically, so here, we got to basically the end of the second cycle. So this value, this is 50, so if I'm discarding every third value, that should be like a 48 that I actually kept. And so that should, no, I didn't, it isn't. Yeah, 16, right? So it should be like here, but it's, apparently it's this value. Okay, oh, no, this is, this is 50, so this is, this is 0.48. This is the 48th. 0, yeah, this is 48, and so here is 16, so it's this value, so basically it's as if this part I shouldn't have drawn. This entire set of 49 samples got reduced to this chunk of, of 16 samples. Right. It's just that actually I only, I only draw, drew 48 samples, there were more, and so when I downsampled them I got as many, you know, I got samples out, but I had to use a lot more of these to get them out. Yeah. Yes, I mean, we ha so the frequency is faster. We haven't really defined frequency yet, but if you're thinking about this as the sampling of an underlying sinusoid, this is the sampling of an underlying, si underlying sinusoid with this period, a period of approximately 24 samples. And this would be the um, sampling of an underlying sinusoid with a period of whatever it is. Six, one, one two, three, four, five, six, eight or something, yeah, okay. Um, now the the reason that, that the reason that this is tricky is because like well what what exactly did the downsampling mean? One thing could be like I have a sequence and I'm thinking about it as a sequence of 16 kilohertz and I downsampled it and now I've got a sequence which is also 16 kilohertz but it's one third the length and the frequency is three times higher. It could the, the other way of thinking about it is I had a sequence of the 16 kilohertz I downsampled it by three I'm now regarding this as a sequence that sampled at 16 on three kilohertz, right, five and some, five and a bit kilohertz. It's the same sinusoid, it's just that I'm sampling at a lower rate, and this would be, this would be the discrete time sequence I would have gotten if I'd used a lower sampling rate at the beginning. In discrete time, discrete time doesn't know about sampling rate, doesn't know about real time, doesn't know what you're going to do with it. All it knows about is there are a series of numbers here. If you want to connect this with the, with the analog world, then it's your business how you do the, how you do the, 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 the sampling rate. So, from in discrete time perspective, these are just two sequences. They have different different values, and uh, we can we can interpret them in several different ways, and it doesn't affect the math at all. Yeah, that's, that's great. So you said the frequency you is higher. Why is the frequency lower when you Yeah, good question. Um, why if if if. <laughs> Um, it, there's, no, there's no weird answer to that. That's just the way it works. And so what I'm doing here is um, if I wanted to keep the pitch the same while lowering the playback sampling rate, I would need to have decimated like this. Then I would have gotten fewer samples and everything would have been okay. If I lower the sampling rate and I don't decimate, then the frequency gets lower. If I decimate, as we see here, it sort of, it looks like it's pushing the frequency up. So if I decimate and then play at a lower sampling rate, those two things cancel out and the frequency stays the same. So if you, if you decimate, don't change the sampling rate, the frequency goes up. If you lower the sampling rate, don't decimate, the frequency goes down. If you lower the sampling rate and decimate, then they cancel out and the frequency stays the same. Yeah. gives the real signal which can be heard. Does it like that or? Sorry, what? No, like, one down sampling and then playing back, right? Yeah. So there should be this down sampling done first and then decimation later. So decimation basically is not to make the signal back to the analog world. Okay, so you're saying, you're saying what's, the, what's the relationship between down sampling and down decimation? decimation? So I'm only talking about, the only thing I've defined here is decimation. Right, which is like, this is how we build the sequence. And then I'm sort of, there's this general process of downsampling, which is converting the sampling rate to a different sampling rate. 
And decimation is a part of that. It's not the only part. You have to, if you want to do it right, you have to do some other stuff to make sure you don't get some artifacts coming out. But, um, you know, but, but you, so the, then, then there's a the whole idea of you, you, you have to process that when you've still got the information to do, to do, to do downsampling, do sample rate conversion safely. You take all the information, you do some stuff on this, some filtering basically to make it safe. And then the last thing you do is you throw away the sample you didn't want. Then you're okay. If you do this first, you know, clearly there's information lost here. And so on, in, the, in bad circumstances, this can hurt you. And you have to be careful that you don't mess up your signal if you're trying to do something. Yeah. 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 Right. So here's the example again. The original speech. Sound D S R. The football team coach has a watch. Ben has a dime. Now, in that lab, I can I can downsample. Um, like this, There's, you know, I can use the indexing operator, and um, I can say one to end. But if I say one colon three to end, what that means is it takes every third sample. And so the, the the size of D is 49,000 samples. The size of DL is 16,000. You know, it's one third of that, right? And so now, if I if I play this DL, and I haven't changed the sampling rate. It's, it's one third the duration. The frequencies have all been shifted up by a factor of three, which is, I wish it would work, which is this, right? These nice lower frequencies all got squeezed into these higher frequencies, which gave, gave the squeaking sound. Yes, right, this is just simple operation, no, no fancy so less trying to splice pitch cycles together. Yeah. Excellent. So what we're saying is, well, that was like three times too fast. So if we actually made the sample rate one third, then it should be back to the right kind of time scale. The football team coach has a watch. Then it's So it's the it is the right duration, the right pitches. It's not the same though, right? It sounds kind of uh, I don't know what you would say. Uh, yes, yes. The total the, the total number of samples is reduced. But what's happened is that we're, we're at a lower sampling rate, and obviously that means that we're we're having a less precise <coughs> picture of the waveform, right? Because we've only got values every what it's, you know five thousand something of a second, rather than every sixty thousand. So we've got a coarser description of signal, and so it sounds lower quality. It sounds muffled or something like that. It sounds distorted. Great. That's that. That was a nice demonstration. Okay. Okay. So that's downsampling. Uh, upsampling is as best you can the the complementary operation. So upsampling is um, inserting l minus one zeros between every sample that we care about. So the x upsample is equal to x of n divided by l when n divided by l gives you an integer, right? Because it couldn't be, you can't have a non-integer value in here. So it's x of n divided by l for n equal to integer multiples of l, and it's zero for the l minus one points in between, where n is not an integer multiple of, of l. We draw it with an upwards pointing arrow in the, in, in, the up, in the interpolation factor there. We end up with more samples coming out, and so here's, you know, here are a pair of signals. Here's our, here's our Sinusoid like the result of the downsampling. It's, this is the same thing as we got out of down, downsampling. And here's the result of interpolation. So here's, you know, this is 0, 0.71, 0 0.75, or something. So here's the 0, 0.7, the 1, the 0.75, but each of them now has two zero values in between because this is upsampling by three. And so if we drew out the entirety of the sequence, now this part now is the interpolation of just these first two cycles here. Right? And if we interpolated this entire sequence, it would now be three times as long. We just sh shown the first part. Now, the interesting thing is, right, if you compare, if you think of this as coming after this, so here, 
two slides previously, we had a nice sinusoid down by three. You've got this thing, and then we have this thing go up by three. And here, now this is the same period of the sinusoid that we started with, but it's not the same signal, right? Because now we've got two out of every three samples is, is a zero. And so this is not simply the inverse of downsampling because the downsampling threw stuff away. And at this point, we don't know what those samples were, right? We, we can try and guess. We can say, oh, it looks like maybe they joined up, but there's no reason why they should be. And so at this point, all we can do is, you know, say, well, these, these are values we don't know. We can put zeros in. If we wanted to try and recover from the downsampling, we'd have to make some assumptions about what the signal was and do some other processing. Yeah? So when you, um, back to the MATLAB, when you divide, yeah. you downsample and then you divide, the sampling by three, yeah. is that the same as trying to up sampling? Like, what's the difference between the sampling rate and then or the processing rate? Is that similar? It's similar. Okay. Um, so, you know, um, looking for chalk. Um, what actually happens when we when we do sound SC in MATLAB? We have a set of values, you know, these samples, and they're indexed with n, and then it, they go into a, a, a piece of circuit which generates a voltage. And you know, there are actually different things you do, but essentially, in the first order, you can imagine it generating this voltage, which is actually you know, step changes. So if the voltage changes here, we write a new value to D to A converter. We get a different voltage out for that amount of time. You know, this is like NT and N plus 1T. And so we have this voltage coming out like here. And as we change the sampling rate, then the rate at which we change this voltage varies, right? So um, it's a little bit different from this process, which would be to say, you just write a little blip of voltage out, and then you, then you have nothing, then you write another blip of voltage out. There's some, there's the change in the sampling rate in MATLAB fills in the gaps, not with zeros, but with like, as it were, the holding zero order hold, holding the last value, which is something you could do in the, in the processing domain, but that's not the way we define uh, interpolation, just because zeros are actually a, a more neutral thing. They're not a very useful thing, but they're a more neutral thing to put in. Let's just see what, but of course we can simulate this, right? So we could, um, we could do d up equals zeros length d, say, and then d, I think, is this going to, oh god no, oh no, 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 oh no, oh man. I just tried to, um, to find a square array of like 48,000 samples on both sides, what? Oh, man. which generally speaking exhausts all the RAM of the machine and causes you to reboot. Please, please stop. Please. It used to be easy because you would just run out of memory, but now it's like, oh, I got a 64-bit processor. I'll try and allocate, you know, how much memory that is. And, until it fills up swap, you're in trouble. Really? I, yeah, that's what I tried to do, but. Uh, wait, did it go already? All right, no, we, we're saved. <laughs> okay, now look at that, nice little crash. Um, let me just play you what it sounds like just for contrast, so. Is this going to work? No. Here we go. MATLAB SO1. OK, so we have the, the downsampled version like this, which sounds OK if we get the sampling rate right. Sound DLSR on 3. Football team coach has a watch. Then it's done. And I was trying to do the upsampling. I mean, And I'm going to get it right this time. Length d by 1. And then du, 1, skip by 3 to end, is equal to dl. It's going to buy that. Yeah, look at that. So if we plot um, uh, the first little bit of d here, I don't know if that's actually interesting. Is there anything? Yeah. And then the first little bit of dl underneath it. Um, 
It's hard to see, but basically, so this should be, this, this should be down by a factor of three. So it should be like this entire chunk got squeezed into here by throwing some samples away. And then um, if we plot the du version of this, yeah, there you go. So this has got all these zeros in between, but when it's not zero, it's the sample from up here, but obviously there are all these zeros clipping it. So now we can play back du at the original sampling rate. Football team coach has a lot of phenazodine. It's the right speech, it's the right duration and pitch, but it has this weird kind of, uh, I don't know how you would describe that. It has, it has high frequency content, which is what you get by using a high sampling rate, but the high frequency content is not the right stuff in the original speech, it's actually some aliasing. We'll see it's some artifacts that come by basically rep, you know, taking energy from the lower frequencies and moving it to higher frequencies, which sounds very weird. I mean, you've, you've heard that kind of distortion on some kind of weird radio channels, but that's clearly not, you know, it's not, it should be this signal, right? The football team coach has a watch, then has it on. The muffled signal, you know, sounded like, like this. The football team coach has a watch, then it's redone. And you can sort of hear there's no high frequency, there's no bars or sibilant to that. But if we take the same information in DL and just try and up, you know, use interpolation to make it be the right number of samples, we get DU, but... The football team coach has a watch, then it's redone. It's not, it's not muffled anymore, but it's kind of got this weird metallic artificialness to it. So that's what you get. Right, it sounds, sounds kind of like a damaged speaker. Yeah, a damaged speaker will generate, basically it's generating uh, harmonics of the bass band, but they're not related to the original signal. And so that's what you get with like rattling or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I think the, uh, the signal after upstream range should have three times the uh, yeah. numbers than before. Yeah. The same, uh, so the length of, of D is 49,000 samples. Length of DL is 16,000 350. DL, DU is the upsampled version of DL, right? That's what I've done here. I've set it to, to the values of DL. So the length of, I mean, I, I did actually by construction. I, because MATLAB would not be crazy about me just assigning to values that, you know, not, not assigned to, I don't think it would let me do this, which is why I set to zeros first. I just filled in the values that I wanted. So here DU is actually the upsampling of DL, not? Exactly. If I, I could do the same to, to D, but if I could do the same to D, and we get the same artifacts, but now the artifacts would be at like, you know, higher frequency, high, above eight kilohertz, which are less obvious to listen to. I'm not even sure if, hmm. let's just try that. D times three, DU equals D, and then sound SC, DU SR times three. Football team coach has a watch, then has a dime. That's interesting. So if you listen to that against the original. The football team coach has a watch, then has a dime. The football team coach has a watch, then has a dime. You can hear a little bit of whistling or ringing or, you know, extra sibilant. That's the same distortion that we heard when we took the downsampled and upsampled it, but on this original version. So it's basically introducing extra energy in the high frequencies, because now our sampling rate, right, we're playing this back at 48 kilohertz, so we've got tons of bandwidth. But we're adding energy up there, which isn't the right energy, and so it's, it sounds distorted, but the distortion's much less um, offensive because it's in this frequency region where we're, there's less information to begin with. Yeah. These, these, these are great. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm really happy with um, the opportunity to, you know, to, to, to answer these questions, but it does limit the amount. It's going to take us longer to get through the slides. That's all. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so that's basically all the operations that we're, we're ever going to use in, in the graphical domain. Let's talk about some other definitions quickly. We have like 15 minutes left. Uh, complex numbers. I like, when I introduce something like this, I'd like to be able to sort of, you know, start from scratch and say, well, why do we have these? 
But it's kind of difficult to come up with, you know, that's, that's kind of a big question. Why do we have complex numbers? Um, one way, the sort of the pragmatic explanation is like, look, it's just this thing we do with, with math, with notation. Um, it makes some things really easy. It's, it's a very, it turns out to have, be a very natural way of expressing some of these things. Um, so, you know, that's enough. I think there's more to it than that, but that's enough for us. And so basically it's a way of taking each sample and rather than having a single scalar value associated with it, we have two values, which for whatever reason we call the real and the imaginary part by defining this Im imaginary unit, the square root of minus one, as j. And so we can have a rectangular definite, we can express this in so-called rectangular or Cartesian form, saying that x, a complex value, which could be a complex sequence, is equal to xre, a real part, plus j times xim. xim is also a real number. We scale it by j to get a, an imaginary part, and then the combination of the real part and the imaginary part gives us the complex number. If we do this, we can also define this complex number as having a magnitude, magnitude of x, which is the square root of the sum of the squares, so it's the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle for whose other, whose non-hypotenuse sides are the real imaginary parts. And we can say that it has a phase or an angle of the arc tan of xim on xre, so it's the, it's the one of the angles of that uh, right angle triangle. And so that means we can express x equivalently in polar form as, the mag as magnitude times a phasor e to the j theta, which um, you know, this is however you want to see it. This, we can say this is just a convention for talking about the value that is the cosine of theta and j times the sine of theta, this thing here, which I call Euler's equation. Um, it's a little bit more than the convention, but it is, that's what we're thinking about here. So e to the j, e to the j theta is a, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to talk about it without, you know, m my mental picture, but it's, because it doesn't rely on the mental picture, but the mental picture is how I think about it and basically makes it all make sense which is this. So now we think about the real and imaginary parts as two axes on a Cartesian plane. And so if we have a complex vector, a complex value x, we can think about it as a vector on this plane where its projection onto the, what used to be called the x-axis is now the real axis, is the real part xre. Its projection onto the, what used to be the y-axis, which is now the imaginary axis, is xim. And then the length of this vector is the square root of xre squared plus xim squared, which is what we just defined as the magnitude of x. And the angle here, the angle to the origin with the real axis is theta, which we just defined as the, the phase or the angle of the complex value. The nice thing about this representation is that it makes addition very natural. So if I have a, a complex vector x, another complex, sorry, complex value x, another complex value y, if I just stack them end to end, then their sum here, x plus y, is the right, is what we get algebraically, that it's the real part is the sum of the real parts, the imaginary part is the sum of the imaginary parts. Um, and the length is given by, you know, this triangle here, so it's whatever it is, in terms of the triangle rule, length of this times length of this times the cosine of that angle, something like that. Um, but it, you know, it all, it's, not, it's, it's, it's obvious what we're trying to do. When we have this um, polar form, the nice thing about rep representing it like this is there's no summing involved. So if you multiply two of these together, then um, it's kind of natural that these two things, the, if I just multiply them together, I can just basically rearrange the terms of these, uh, these terms and the multiplication. So I get R times S times two exponentials. We know that if we multiply two exponentials together, there are, the, the values are being exponentiated, add together. So you get r times s times e to the j theta plus psi, theta plus phi. Um, and so that this is the product of x and y. Doesn't look, doesn't, the, the, the Cartesian picture doesn't really help us that much here. At least the length is just whatever, the scaling of these two compared to one. It does help with the angle though. The angle here is the sum of this angle and this angle here. So the angles add up. And the only, the only catch is that, of course, if you, if you end up going all the way around more than one complete revolution, then the, in this picture, the angle is only identifiable to within 
too high to within one revolution. And that's, in fact, the way we, we run it, that phases are um, modulo 2 pi. So, you know, uh, neither am I hoping, I'm not trying to teach you complex numbers. And I'm not expecting that any of this is new. I'm just going over the key points because they're going to be the things that we need to be familiar, be, you know, have at the top of our minds when we're, talking, when we're dealing with this stuff. One thing that we define in the complex domain is the complex conjugate, which is basically um, it's denote, denoted by x asterisk x star. And if x was xre plus j xim, then x conjugate is xre minus jim. We just took the, kept the real part the same, took the imaginary part, and changed its sign, which is the same as taking the polar form and flipping the sign of the angle here. So here's x. Here's x conjugate. One of the reasons we're interested in x conjugate is because if I add x to x conjugate, then I sort of go, I go up by a certain amount of imaginary stuff, and I come back down by the same amount of imaginary stuff. So I get a real value, which is just twice the real um, part of x. If I multiply by x conjugate, then I have these two magnitudes of x, and I have e to the j theta and e to the j minus theta. So again, the, the uh, complex part disappears. But now the magnitude of x times x theta is magnitude of x squared. So sometimes it's, we like to be able to generate x conjugate because it's a good way of getting from imaginary values back to real values, either the real part or the magnitude, which are the parts that we are most often concerned with. Um, OK, so let's now define a few um, categories or classes of sequences. Again, because we might want to talk about operations that apply to certain categories. We've already come across this idea of a sequence that is either finite or infinite. So whether it, whether it is defined for all values of n or only a subset of values of n. We had like causal, anti-causal, special cases of, of finite sequences, so semi-finite sequences. Real and complex sequences, so you know, complex math applies to single values, but if we have a sequence of those values, we can have a, a complex sequence as the sum of a, a real sequence and j times a, se a separate real sequence, the imaginary parts. We can classify sequences according to their symmetry, and there are various kinds of symmetry that are interesting to us. So if we have a sequence x of n defined as a real part and an imaginary part, here I'm plotting, I'm trying to plot a complex sequence in 3D. So here this axis is n, which is the, the normal axis, the time axis that we've looked at so far for sequences. But then for each value of n, I'm putting down a, a complex plane with a real part, an imaginary part. And so we have this set of red values here are the real parts, x re of n, so the sequence here. And there's a separate, completely independent sequence, x i m of n, which I'm plotting as you know, a sequence in the orthogonal plane, this imaginary plane here. And so actually, if we take the, if we join up these points, we get the actual value, the complex value of x of n. So if we have a sequence which is like this, we can talk about its symmetry in terms of the symmetry of these real imaginary parts. And it turns out that the most useful thing is to define the symmetry sort of uh, differently for the real and the imaginary parts. And so we have uh, a, a notion of conjugate symmetry, which is uh, a sequence which if we flip, flip it around zero in the time axis, if we flip the time axis, then we end up with the conjugate sequence. So when we reverse the time, time axis, the real parts stay the same, but the imaginary parts um, flip. So uh, the conjugate symmetric, if x is conjugate symmetric, then um, we'll have the sequence such that it'll be its, its original real part time flipped, its original imaginary part time flipped, but with the sign flipped as well. And so this is an illustration of a conjugate symmetric sequence. What this is saying is the real parts have to be even. They have to be the same when you flip them in, in the, in the around zero. And the imaginary parts have to be odd. They have to flip sign when you flip them around zero, which also means that the point at zero has to be zero itself, because uh, it has to be its own negative. So this is conjugate symmetry. And then we can talk about conjugate antisymmetry as the opposite of that, which is where when we um, con conjugate antisymmetric sequence, when you flip it in time, it conjugates and it flips in sign which because conjugation is just flipping the sign of the imaginary part, 
means that the real part changes in sign and the imaginary part stays the same in sign. So basically, a conjugate antisymmetric sequence, a picture of that would look the same, but now the red would be the imaginary part and the blue would be the real part. Okay. But uh, you know, that, that actually covers everything you need because um, any sequence can be expressed as conjugate symmetric and conjugate antisymmetric parts, right? Sort of like real and even, real and even and odd. Um, you, can, you can always write down, a, if you have an arbitrary complex X of N, you can break it up into two, one part that's conjugate symmetric, one part that's conjugate antisymmetric, um, because you can always construct a conjugate symmetric sequence out of X of N by taking a sequence and then taking its conjugate time-reversed part, which is sort of guaranteed to be conjugate symmetric because this part is always going to balance with this part. And you can do the same to generate conjugate anti-symmetric sequence by subtracting the conjugate part off. So you can verify that these parts are indeed conjugate symmetric and conjugate anti-symmetric. And you can verify that when you add these together, if you use these halves, these parts reinforce, these parts cancel. So the sum of these two does give us um, the original x back. If we have a real sequence, which is to say that x i m in you know the x i m part is identically zero, then we don't have to worry about the imaginary parts at all. It means that um, the only part of the sequence that exists is the real part. So the conjugate symmetric means that it's even because the real part was even. It was you know x of m was equal to x of minus n. And the conjugate antisymmetric means that it's odd. X of n is equal to negative of x of minus n. But normally, whenever we're talking about this stuff, it, we normally think about the sequences, even if they are real sequences, they could be imaginary. They just com they could they could be complex. They they're complex sequences complex sequences whose imaginary parts are zero. And so the the notations of symmetry that we think about are conjugate symmetry and conjugate antisymmetry. So if you show me a real even sequence, I could say, ah, that's a, a conjugate symmetric sequence whose imaginary part is zero. Um, so some basic sequences that, you know, elemental sequences, the delta sequence, delta of n is one and n equals zero and zero everywhere else. Very useful sequence, only has one non-zero value. Um, of course, only having it for, for time zero is a bit limiting, but we can generate delta sequences with non-zero values at other points simply by delaying the delta, which is, if you remember, the delay is y of, x, y of n equals x of n minus big N. So delta of n minus k is the, is the function that is non-zero only at n equal k, like this. We note in passing that if we have some sequence of values where it's got specific values at every time, so here alpha 0 is, say, x of n for n equals 0, alpha 1 is x of n for n equal 1, we can express this as alpha 0 times this entire sequence, delta of n, plus alpha 1 times this entire sequence. So it's like we're scaling entire sequences by constant values. But because the, the sequences we're scaling you only have a single non-zero point, then we end up with these the constants only appearing at one point in time. So this is, this is a very kind of uh, long-winded way of describing a sequence like this, but it turns out to be useful later on when we want to do some uh, analysis. It's, an, it's, a, it's a powerful way of thinking about a sequence. Um, the other kind of elemental sequence is the unit step, which is basically the, the integral of the delta function where you know, we're not talking about continuous time now, so it's the sum from k equal minus infinity to n of uh, delta of k. So if we have our delta function, if we sum everything from the beginning of time up to some point up here, it's still 0. Once we cross the, zero, the, one, the, the zero, n equals 0 point where it's 1, then from then on, the sum from there to here is always 1. And we get the step function. So that's the step function is the discrete integral from negative infinity of delta of k. And delta of n is the first order difference of of mu of n. So it's mu of n minus the value it had in the previous sample. Here it's always 0, here it's 1, and here it's 0 again because there's no difference between mu of n and mu of n minus 1. Um, and so more interesting sequences we can talk about are things like exponential sequences. So if we have x of n equals some constant a 
times some other constant alpha raised to the power of n, right? So n is our dependent variable here, or in, our index here. Then we can end up with some sequences that take on different values for every value of n. Um, if we think about a and alpha as real, and in this case positive, and if alpha is greater than one, then obviously as we raise it to higher, larger and larger powers, we get this diverging exponential sequence. And if alpha is smaller than one, but greater than zero, then it sort of decays away with this nice exponential decay. Of course, if we think about what happened back here, we have the same thing of it getting arbitrarily large as time goes on. But if we just think about it going forward in time, then it decays away. And this is now beginning to look like a real physical system that we might want to deal with. Um, but, but the real power of exponentials is when we think about alpha as a complex value that, for instance, may have a, um, a, 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 a real part and an imaginary part. So, if, you know, arbitrary, you know, we can, we can think about alpha as having some magnitude and phase, which we can, we can express as a, a real part of the exponential and a, an, an imaginary part of the exponential. And so and we can also put a complex constant in front, but the complex constant is not very interesting. What's interesting here is the part that depends on n. So now we have, if it's the same expression, x of n is alpha to the n, but now because alpha is complex, we have a e to the sigma n, a real exponential decay or growth, and a varying phase, e to the j omega n plus phi, where phi came from the constant here. And this is this varying phase, and the phase is basically linear in, in, in index, in time. The, the every, for every value of x of n, the phase relative to the previous one is an extra omega radians. And so we end up with this, again, with this 3D plot of the real and the imaginary in time. We get these values where, at each time step, the phase just steps on by an extra omega. So here's... Here's like the dotted line is the value of the previous sample, and then here's the angle that the next one makes with it. So here it's advanced by omega, and then for point two, it's starting at this lower angle. It's advancing by another omega radians, et cetera. And so this is, um, we call this a complex exponential with frequency omega radians per sample, which means that the it's this thing that's going to eventually wrap around to be periodic if it doesn't decay away. But the, the, uh, the rate at which it wraps around, we measure is how much it rotates per sample step. And so we measure that in radians per sample. And omega is our, our convention for, you for describing that. Um, all right, I'm going to have to talk more about that on Wednesday. I, I'm a little bit concerned that um, we didn't really cover everything we need to cover to do the problem set. So um, do what you can in the problem set. And if you get to a question where, you've, where you know I haven't spoken about it, you can have a go if you want. You can look at it in the book, or we'll, uh, we'll cover it on Wednesday, and we'll accept that question later. All right, any, any other questions before we finish? All right, see you on Wednesday. Thanks.